knee. Uh, I'm going to focus mostly on the knee today as far as the specific cases, my disclosures. It's hardly a new concept. So in 1959, Dr. Townley performed an outpatient total knee replacement. This may have been the first total knee anyway. So he used a Townley tibial plate, which cost the grand sum of $75, a McKeever patellar uh, resurfacing. And he, on the femur, including the trochlea, he used uh, polyurethane, ostomer. And I saw this patient 30 years later. It all worked out. This is long before Medicare. Commercial insurance wasn't m very active in the 1950s. So this really isn't a, a new concept, outpatient joint replacement. Well, why would we do it? You know, now I think we do it because of bed space at hospitals. COVID and post-COVID has really impacted that. So there's a lot of motivation to get these cases to surgery centers. That's probably my big driver right now. But there are medical issues, too. You can lower your thrombus risk because you're getting your patient up and going. Hospital-acquired infections, if you're never at a hospital, you aren't going to have one. Enhanced recovery, and probably there is lower cost. At least it's, it's shifted around a little bit. Why not? Well, you're going to have to have high touch with your patient. You've got to know them better. You've got to talk to them more. I give them my cell phone number. They might need an admission on a rare occasion, fortunately not often. And that's not easy to do now, at least in our hospital, because bed availability is not very good. So you do have to worry about that a little bit. Anxiety, that's true for all of us, the staff, myself, the patients. There's more anxiety. You just have to manage that. If you're not willing, maybe not an outpatient. It's not fully accepted. There are people who really expect to be in a hospital for this. What it's not, this is not a change in discharge criteria. Our patients meet the same discharge criteria whether they're inpatient or out, the same exact discharge criteria. It's not shoved you to the door in a wheelchair. This is not hospital at home where you get to your home, there's a nurse waiting for you or a physical therapist. It's a true outpatient. You go home, you fend for yourself, you do the things you're instructed to do. It, it, it's, it's not a, a glorified hospital at home at all. Uh, I'm the PT unless there's a, something else set up. We don't have physical therapy at our ambulatory centers and don't think we need it. It is a change in perception. If you're going to do this, you have to get your patient and to some extent yourself performing more like a, an athlete. You know, athletes have a great connection of their effort to their abilities. They get the most out of the skills they have. That's what you need for your patient here. They've really got to get in touch with what they can do and take advantage of it. People are not particularly great at this all the time. You also have to get in touch with your emotions. You have to realize you're, you're going to have pain and you're going to have to manage through it. That doesn't mean get rid of all your pain. That can't be your expectation. You're going to have to function with your pain. Same thing with your anxiety. You know, a soldier has to work through anxieties they have to be effective in their job. So does a fireman, so does a police officer, so does your patient if you're going to do this kind of thing. It's critical to, to manage your emotions when moving to the outpatient. What are the indications? Well, these are evolving. These would be relative indications. This is what we started with. You still need a motivated patient. And um, <clears throat> obesity is a little bit of an issue. Support person, for sure. 55% of recovery is modifiable. You have to start with that premise, and you really have to work on this and take advantage of that. You can manage pain and anxiety, and support people can help. <clears throat> Draw out these comments, identify them, and have reorientation if you hear any of them, because these are not going to take you where you need to go. These are the concepts to understand and deal with. Patients have them. Probably everybody has a little bit of this. You have to know about kinesiophobia, perceived exertion. This is probably the biggest one. P people have um, a perception that they're trying their hardest when they're not. They can, they can do better. And we have to make sure they do. Take advantage of their own potential. And it's there. You can really capitalize on that. 
pain catastrophizing, um, managing pain, that's done with expectations, not with drugs. We learned that in the 90s. Giving people drugs is not the way. Support person. This is the most common reason you won't be successful if you're not. This, this, this is going to get you the one star rating, uh, it, that support person. I make sure I connect with the support person every single time. And if, if I don't think this is the right support person, I'll make a change. Uh, I'll, if the husband doesn't want to do it, or the spouse, I'll change. You say, do you have another person that could help you, a friend or another family member? Pay attention to that. And the caregiver's got to do, it's a, it's a critical job. If something's not going well, they have to tell your patient they're fine, and then go in the next room and call you and tell you, you know, how things really are so you can correct it. You don't need two problems, the original one, and then uh, panic on top of it. Here's your perfect patient. This is a patient of mine from many years ago. Took his own external fixation pins out with a smile. And this is who you want. And you're not going to get that every time. This is what you hope to get. This is what you don't want. Somebody comes in, I showed that yesterday. I don't even think this patient should have an operation at all, much less an outpatient joint replacement. What are the contraindications? Again, they're evolving. Our center will allow up to 350 pounds and BMI up to 40. I don't take advantage of that very often. Um, ASA, uh, you know, it's a relative thing uh, about that, but you certainly have to have someone medically stable to be, someone who doesn't have a good support system is a definite contraindication though, still is. Be wary of preoperative narcotics. That's going to be a tough patient to control. Anxiety, that you can't talk them down. If somebody tells you they've called 911 for not good reason, back away. <laughs> that, that's going to get you a phone call you don't need. These are things that we all looked at and are still sometimes used that we can't be sure have a lot of benefit. And um, Expro, we get by without it now just fine. It was a cost saved. IV Tylenol, same thing. We give it orally. Tylenol is great, but we don't need it IV now. We don't put drains in anymore. We're not using any home care. Pain pumps kind of came and went for us. We did over 1,000 pain pumps. Now we use periarticular injections on everybody. Occasionally adductor canal blocks. They seem to be innocuous enough, but many of our patients don't have those either, and they do about the same. Uh, special programs, you don't need to enroll in one of these, like Swift Path or some of the others. You can do this yourself with your own dedication and knowledge and co confidence. You need confidence to do this. This is probably the biggest thing. People are going to get lightheaded, dizzy, faint, and nurses will call it sh shock. It's not really shock like uh, Dr. Blaylock would have talked about. But they do get, uh, they might have a syncopal episode, whatever you want to call it. You don't usually get a medical reason. It's usually not volume depletion. We're using ERA measures now. We have people drink Gatorade before. That's helped. But mostly, you just try again. They get lightheaded. You sit them back down. This, this is what I'll get involved. I'll get them up with the staff. You can usually get past this. But, but it, it's not a serious medical issue. It does not require hospital admission. I went through this with my wife. She had a total hip, got her home. She had this. It is frightening <laughs> to do. I'm there by myself with her, some old lady, fainting like that. <laughs> I didn't take her to the hospital. I got her through it. <laughs> outpatients. You can do outpatients. Here's a, a woman who had Stills disease. She had total knees. Maybe they're not the greatest total knees in the world, but they were cemented in. They weren't loose. And then the polys wore out on each side. And um, what could we do? Well, we decided these are pretty simple revision. At least the one on the left was just a modular knee. The one on the right, that's not a modular knee. So I had to you know, carve up a new uh, piece of polyethylene that would fit and, and get it in there. But it, you can do it as an outpatient. It's not a complicated surgery. And um, we're, again, we're, she's got many more years now on these um, not ideally positioned, but well-fixed knees. Here's uh, something I'm very proud of. In this month's Journal of Arthroplasty, my paper's in there about doing this. 
This is adding an additional compartment to a well-performing, well-placed uni-compartmental. And here I did a total knee on, uh, on the uh, one side, but when she came back with that uni, the lateral was still good, but she had pain behind the patella immediately. So I addressed those two additional compartments, left the original uni compartmental there, and th that you can do as an outpatient. You can bill it kind of as a primary operation too, so there's contracts in place to, so our surgery center would allow that. It's a good thing. If you do it just right and you have the right indication, it's, it's a little better and cheaper and more efficient, less traumatic way than doing a full-on revision. So I encourage you to give this a look. In my paper, you can look it up. It shows how it all works out. Here's a one you'd think, well, why would you do this as an outpatient? Well, there was a, a financial consideration involved. The patient was a cash payment patient. I, I have these every week now. One of the surgery centers I work at is cash only place. And so this patient had a, a, a pretty bearable surgical endeavor that's a spacer implant, so you're going to get that out pretty easy. It's intended to come out easy, and, and it did. And then we were able to get a reasonable uh, cost arrangement on the revision implant, and did that as an outpatient, worked fine. I'll do complex primaries. Again, I'll put in a, this one needs some support in the femur, and a rod's pretty cheap. It's cheaper than a stem femoral component, so we're able to do this one that way. Uh, again, went ahead with just a primary knee replacement, backing it up, all fine. So a few stats. Uh, I've got 471 patients that we have good statistics on with good follow-up. They, they are younger than our other patients a little bit, and, but they're otherwise just kind of selected the way I talked about with indications. We, we have not had any deaths. Only one PE, which is way below what we used to get. And the infections are not so common either. They still happen, though. Um, two admissions, neither one really for a medical issue. I haven't had a medical issue that drove one uh, yet. The outcomes, they're, they're better than inpatients. People are happier. In the end, this, this does work. And 95% of our patients, we have a survey that we send them. Only 5% said they, 1 out of 20, said they weren't satisfied. 95% uh, said they were. I wish I'd have had that stat on the idea up front. That I'd like to know how many of them really were sold when I told them we were going to do it that way, because I, I do push this pretty hard. But on the back end, I do have that statistic, because our center got it, and it was 95%, so pretty darn good. Thanks a lot.